G'day guys, welcome to the Oak Barrel After Hours uh, episode 5 VII here at the Oak Barrel. My name is Scott Fitzsimons and sitting to my left is... Is it 5 or 7? 7, VII, yeah, yeah, 7, yeah, what did yeah. I say? You said 5. No, it's definitely 7. <laughs> okay. Hell of a way to start. <laughs> We're off to a flyer. <laughs> Um, so Joe Perry sitting to my left has been at the Hunter Valley all week so I've been sitting here stuck at work so yeah. we're going to be in different mindsets a little bit tonight I think um, the, the, the pushback back to a Wednesday yes we, we're so determined on keeping it Mondays or Tuesdays and then that just, just went down the drain it's pretty not quickly gonna happen. It's yeah not gonna happen. Um, but yes if you are tuning in for the first time to one of these after hours basically here at the Oak Barrel um, the bottle store in the centre of the CBD here on Elizabeth Street in Sydney has closed for the night. Uh, we've kicked everyone out. We're just here by ourselves now. And so what we're going to do is do what we do pretty much every night, is talk about some whiskies, talk about some wine. Uh, but this time we're going to film it and let you guys in here. So um, already seeing a few people jump on the live stream. Thank you for that. Um, but please feel free to, to ask any questions and, uh, and that sort of thing uh, with, with how we go and what we do. Uh, particularly if things go down and uh, disappear into oblivion, which they can do. Yeah, and sometimes. have done. Yeah. yeah. But as long as you can see us and you can hear us, I think. It's, a, it's a head start. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Joey, just back from the Hunter. Yeah. It's still yeah, there. So, um, it's it's still there. It's still there. They're in um, they're in good spirits. A lot of the a lot of the guys that we uh, work with uh, was out visiting. Left uh, very early Monday morning. Came back very early this morning. Um, just just very quickly, obviously, there was a lot going on sort of in country New South Wales and also Queensland and all parts of the country over the last couple of weeks. Um, but it was nice to see, you know, a lot, a lot of friendly faces, a lot of um, positive energy. I mean, there, there is discussions of, of smoke taint and things like that going around at the moment. But obviously, until they're, they're not grapes there at the moment, they're just little just starting to, um, to come off the grow onto the vine. Uh, so no, it was, it was, it was good. It was, it's warm. I mean, it's just, you can say it and you can say it and you can say it, but you get there and it's bloody dry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can yeah. try and tell people all, all sorts of things, but even the, the drive out and I think yesterday we got to about 38 during the day and for Oof. most of the day and yeah, there's just, um, you know, not a lot of bright, bright greenery going around, but, um, so people are still in very good spirits, which is which is nice. That's and, good. Yeah, I think I think Adelaide did about forty two today. Yeah, and they're under extreme conditions at the moment. So, um, I mean, I think saving homes and loss of life is is yeah. the most yeah. priority yeah. thing yeah. at the yeah. moment. <laughs> um, and then we can worry about grapes and smoke taint yeah. in a in a little while. But um, it's good to have you back. G'day to to Mike who's tuning in. Um, and we sort of uh, I'm denied about who was going to go first tonight. But I think I'm going to take the initiative and go first with a couple of whiskies. Go for it. Because I want to do two tonight. Because I really had not too much idea what I was going to do tonight um, until about half an hour ago. Yeah. And I was like, okay, let's do either a Jura or a Glenallachy. I've got them both open. And then I thought, actually, two distilleries that on paper have not a lot to do with each other, but in reality do. Um, so I'm going to pour probably Glenallachy for both of us first. Talk a little bit about this distillery uh, and then compare it to this and I don't even know exactly how this is going to go but we'll, we'll figure it out um, but I think the background on these is, is quite important so take one of them cool. I'll take one of these so Glen Allerkey is a relatively new distillery by Scotch Whiskey um, standards uh, built in 1967 um, by a, a company called uh, Charles McKinlay Limited they had a couple of names I believe but uh, was basically a subsidiary of a, a I think it was Scott, Scottish Newcastle mm. Brewers and that sort of thing. Um, g'day Dylan, good Dylan? to see you today good actually, to you're in, today. In, in the store today. Um, so basically it, it went through that um, for, for a little while, um, but in 1987 um, a company called Invergordon um, bought uh, Scottish Newcastle Distillers um, in 1987, uh, sorry in 1985 and in 1987, two years later, Glenallachie was deemed surplus to requirements. Um, and then it was in 89 that it became part of the Shivers family and has gone into their blends predominantly, uh, the Campbell clan blend uh, for, for a long, long while, up until 2017 when a bloke called Billy Walker, his pocket lined with money thanks to the Brown Foreman uh, Corporation who had bought uh, the Ben Rea, Glendronach and Glenglassale distilleries off him, bought Glenallachie 
and sort of changed its um, its life. It's no longer a blender's malt. We see it, you know, regularly as now a single malt of its own concern. And we're just on the 18 year old here. But before we go too far into that, I want to talk about Jura. So Glenalke is also in, in Speyside, right in the middle of the, the Scottish Highlands. Jura is not. The fact that there is anything on Jura is quite a remarkable achievement, let alone <laughs> a working, a functioning distillery. And we're talking about 16, uh, sorry, 18, uh, 67, uh, sorry, 1967 here. We're talking about 1810 when yeah. Jura was built. Um, small island in the Inner Hebrides, everything goes via Isla. If you want to get to Jura or you need to get machinery or equipment to Jura, you get it to Isla and then you ferry it to, to Jura. So very, very old school. Um, place not a huge population the island's covered in peat uh, so on paper distilleries their starting years couldn't be too you know further away but um had a bit of an up and down life i think because of its remoteness getting stuff to market in the uh, yeah. 19th century so you got to 1901 and it's basically stopped and by 1910 jura's been demolished and so there's not a lot there some old buildings but all the equipment's gone and that sort of stuff in 1962 a company uh, takes it over and in 1963 distilling starts again and who is that company that started distilling again it was your boys um mckenzie limited uh, sorry mckinlay limited oh right, right so yeah, yeah. in actual fact when we talk about jura in 2019 we're not talking about a distillery that was built in 1810 we're talking about what was built in the mid uh, 60s and if you remember back this distillery glen was built only four years later and um in the 60s, if you're making Scotch, building Scotch whiskey distilleries, the market is for America. So you're making whiskey distilleries that make quite light, often cereal forward um, spirits to go into blends and, and that sort of thing, because that's what the American market um, wanted. We can go into that a little bit more. But basically, they built a distillery in Speyside that was very, very similar to what they were doing in Jura. Jura wasn't using any of its peat in that second rebuild because they wanted it to go into these, these lighter blends. And so you had very similar distilleries. It's actually why when Invergordon took it over in the uh, the mid-80s, that two years later they shut Glenallachie down and said, we, why do we need two of the same thing, mm. basically? So two distilleries that have completely different backstories from two completely different parts of the world, uh, parts of Scotland, actually built in very, very similar ways. And I'm going to pour, which should I pour the Glenallachie? I'll pour the Glenallachie, now. yeah. Um, I think as well, you know... I've heard when people talk about Glenallachy and you walk into that distillery and they've got these quite unusual, very wide, quite tall stills, people describe them as Jura-like. Yeah, right. And when you talk about Jura stills, you talk about how tall they are. They're the second tallest in Scotland, um, following only Glenmorangie, but nowhere yeah. near as thin. So you get a, a thicker spirit. So two distilleries that are quite completely different um, now, and I think tasting them, we're going to try and pick out some similarities, but... Um, they're, they're very different whiskies, and then opposed to when they started, completely different eras. So, yeah. Uh, the, the first one, the Glenallachy, is that thing, that very serial forward sort of note yeah. still um, still exists. Um, you know, I guess talk a little bit more about why Billy Walker took Glenallachy. Um, he did quite well out of the Glendronach. Uh, ben React on gas sale to Brown Formans. He had a lot of money, but when you are looking to buy a distillery, um, you're not looking for pretty buildings and pretty stills and, and water sources and that sort of stuff. These days, you're looking for how much stock is sitting in a warehouse. Mm. And I know there's a couple of distilleries in Scotland, um, you know, that were on the market in the past few years, and it came down to what's in the warehouse, what can I bottle straight away. And because it had been, you know, working so hard for blends, yes, there was a lot of stuff lying around. So Billy Walker's gone in um, in 2017, and then last year launched a series of whiskies: a 12-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 25-year-old, and a 10-year-old cast strength, built on what he could, you know, find in those warehouses. What they're distilling right now is is probably a, a separate story, a different story, because it's it's going to be pretty crazy moving forward. But I love this idea of this creation. He's gone in and said. I didn't distill this. I had no hand in this. But you know, what can I create out of this? So this is an 18-year-old from a number of casks. It's not a finish in XYZ, or it's not you know side-by-side -side maturation. None of this was designed to go into um, uh, you know a single malt essentially. It was all meant to go into blends. So I think it's a really interesting whiskey. You can't read too much into the label. Um, the label design, if you can see there, 
it might be questionable to, to some people. Not yeah. everyone's stoked on how that label design came out. Yeah. But um, it's non-chill filtered, um, natural colour, aged at least 18 years. And that's all you've got to go on. Yeah. Is that like, what's, what's wrong with a Glenelg that, that sort of modern font design approach thing? Or um, I think it's not the modern font approach thing because I think, you know, Ben Riak, not Ben Riak, uh, uh, Brook Laddick with their mm. sort of opaque bottles and the optimal yeah, bottles. Yeah, I think they yeah. did excellent with it. I think what they did with Glen Jonick and then with Ben, um, ben Riak with these very don't lock yourself into a distillery colour, you know. Mm, okay, right, right, right. You know, that can be really great. And they've done the same thing. Each one has got a different colour. Mm. I just think that that gold tint, I mean, you can probably see it okay there on the stream, but sitting behind a darkened bar, that's going to be quite hard to pick out. Right, right. I think, and the, yeah. you know, you put the two next mm. together, which is the one that you can see better. Mm. I would have loved to have seen a white Glenalgy in a slightly bigger font. Anyway, we're talking about um, things that aren't the whiskey at this point in time. Mm. But that cereal note. Yeah, thing you mentioned is so prevalent. It's still for, mm. and I've, you know, these are big wide still, so you're not getting as much reflux. You're carrying quite quick um, still runs through. Yeah. Um, and I've heard that um, the uh, Glenallachie, when they run the the stills with uh, like a, well, they're using like slightly cold water in the condenser, they can, uh, because they're running it so quick, they can get sulfur coming through. Mm. So they're actually, condenser water is a little bit warmer so that it coaxes some of those lighter flavors out. Yeah because there's so much of the cereal notes going across. Um, but yeah, I, I love the fact that, you know, when you, you drink Tormor, you drink Ultivain, you drink Glenallachie, mm. you see that cereal front and yeah. center. It's very much a product of its place when when they were building this distillery, they said, we need something light yeah, and cereal. Yeah, yeah. That's what the Yanks want, and that's what the Yanks are gonna get. Mm. Um, that's tasty though. Yeah. This is, this is at 46%. I find this quite shy. The Glen Alkey. Mm. Um, when it first came out, we, we did, um, when the, the first batches last year, we sort of did 12, 10 car strength, 18, 25, and the 18 suffered because it wasn't the 10 car strength. Right. Because right, that was right, so right. vibrant. Mm. But the longer we've had this open, um, and this bottle's been open now for about a month, I think, mm -hmm. it's really starting to show its complexity and, and what's going on in there. I was going to say, there's definitely that, that heat kind of coming through, even at 46%. Yeah. It just like has that lingering sensation. To think it's like, and there's like there's real sweetness coming through now yeah. as well, like a candied sweetness. I probably yeah. put the name up so you can see what we're talking about. Yeah, there's almost like that. Yeah, like that jammy, chewy kind of nuance that comes through. Cracking little whiskey though. And g'day a in country uh, Victoria. Mm. I think this is a whiskey you'd like. Paul Slater as well. Good to hear you tuning in from Melbourne. Um, yeah, it's it's a real funny one. So what we're doing with what we're drinking from Glenallachy now is the stocks that we're laying around. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to happen in the future is going to be very, very crazy. So to sort of put things in perspective, Glenallachy has a uh, you know a capacity of about 4 million litres um, uh, annual uh, alcohol liters per year. Mm -hmm. That's what it can do. At the moment, they're working pretty much full tilt and are getting about, they'll do, you know, 700,000 liters. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the breakdown there is because they've got, they're doing like 150, 160 hour fermentations, which to put in uh, Scotch whiskey uh, perspective, um, Jura is about 50. And that's about average, 50 to 55. Yeah, yeah. You're talking 75, 80. That's, you know, brand ambassadors and distillers going, we're doing 80 hour fermentations. Yeah, like, check yeah, us yeah. out. We're not cutting any corners. 160 is ridiculous. They're doing. So that's five? Yeah. No, seven days? Yeah. 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 And, you know, when, you, when you're waiting that long to ferment, there's only so much that you can pull through. Mm. Um, Whereas, you know, they're also doing some really heavily peated stuff at about mm -hmm. 80 ppm on the on the mainland there. Mm -hmm. uh, g'day, David, down in Tassie. Hope you're doing well. Um, so the future of Glenallachy does not look like this. Yeah, And yeah, we don't yeah. know where that's going to yeah. go because these are things that have been distilled in the past 18 months, two years mm -hmm. to see where that goes. But um, G'day, Barry. I also like my big whiskeys. Yeah, this is 
Well, do you think, would you call this big whiskey? I mean, it definitely makes itself known. Yeah, I think yeah. it is. It's like, it's not in a big, in a smoke sense or like a really big fortified cast mm. with a sherry or port or whatever that is. Um, is it all M1 yeast? Paul Slater, I have absolutely <laughs> no idea. But thank you for that. Thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, I, I would uh, suspect, and I've, I've only read, read a lot, but I had a bit of a conversation when the, the brand ambassador was out here um, just before Whiskey Fair about three, three, four months ago. And there was a lot of things being thrown around that conversation, a lot of different yeasts and barley That's strains. Just and, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> in one ear, out the other. Yeah. Um, but getting back to the, I think it is a big whiskey in, mm. in its bulk. And I yeah, think yeah, part yeah. of that mm. is, you know, it's quite a, quite a, um, a, a cloudy wort. They want to keep, you know, quite husky barley coming through the brewing process and getting in and out of these big steels mm. without stripping too much and without adding too much to them because I want all that barley to show. The, um, you know, at 18s, it's, it's mellowed out quite, quite a bit. Yeah. Um, it's not as big as it probably once was. But, um, yeah, it's just a... It's, just, it's silky, but bold. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think before we finish that, we might jump onto the mm. Dura because, as I was saying earlier, it's a very similar production. And when they built, they rebuilt Dura in 62, 63, they went for that big American style mm. again. Um, and why, why America? It's a big boom time for America, but not just Prohibition. There was a lot of um, dry states before Prohibition. And even though distillers were firing up again, what they didn't have was stock and backlogs and and those sorts of things. So it was a big part of Scotch whisky moving in and, and taking that market and being part of that. So they put in really big stills. Um, there were some stainless condensers and things that they nicked off Cape Adonic when that closed down, uh, which is the, the second Glen Grant distillery. Um, but they went completely away from that idea of Jura, this island that basically is peat. It's got just as much peat as Isla does. Uh, we know from records, you know, and, and um, you know, reports back in those days that they did make quite heavily peated spirit on Jura to be this light sort of style. Um, with a few different things that has uh, rolled rolled through into today. Um, but I found Jura as we know it today, and it's sort of held on to, it was, it was kept by Invergordon. When Invergordon sold Glenallachy, uh, which was picked up by Shivers, they held on to it, and now, Invergordon got bought by essentially what is now White and Mackay, so it's a sister distillery to places like Dalmore and, and Fetacan. And they've pushed really hard as a, as a single malt. And this is one of the quickest growing. I think the last decade sales for Jura have gone, you know, up by 150%. Yeah, right. Not every distillery can say that. But one thing I've always found about Jura is it is one of the most divisive distilleries. Yeah. You either love it or you really, you know, uh, give or take. You mm. couldn't couldn't care. It comes, it goes. Whether Jura's there or not doesn't really matter. And I have to admit, I've been in the camp of it's great, but there's some other exciting things mm. out. Um, one thing I found quite interesting is that uh, last year they ripped up their core line expressions and reintroduced a whole series of single malts. So they've now got a one called a Journey, which is a non-age statement. Mm -hmm. The ten-year-old, the twelve-year-old, which we're drinking tonight, and then a seven wood which sits above it. Um, and they're starting to use a little bit of peated smoke back in there. You can see that for sure. Yeah. Mm. So this was one of the things I got asked about the most uh, this year. We hadn't arrived in Australia yet, and the, it was still on boats and customs and that sort of thing. People were like, you got that new Jura stuff. Mm. And I never get asked about Jura, mm. except this new stuff was coming in. So we got it in for uh, Whiskey Fair, and uh, I probably, left it quite a little bit late on that one, so we got it right across the line right in the last week <laughs> or two. So sorry for that, guys. Um, but it was one that I really wanted at Whiskey Fair to sort of reintroduce the brand. Um, so yeah, this is the Jura 12, uh, and I'm gonna throw this to you, not in terms of flavor profile. Mm -hmm. What I've always found about Jura is it's it's thick and it's, it's weighty, almost to the point of being messy sometimes, where you can't, or muddy is probably a better word. Mm. We can't pick out specific things, but it just carries this this bulk to it. Yeah, I mean, like, very polarizing, even just on the nose between the two of them. I think. But I, I, I do really enjoy that, like, charred, smoky nuance. It just kind of it just kind of sits there like kind of yeah. you know it, it just integrates itself it's not really that big slap in the face it's just 
Yeah, and it's just like the Glen Alkey, this has been open for about a week now, so I think it's it's showing a little bit more than it than it did previously. But I'm actually really coming around to it, uh, which is why you know I was lent for the Jura tonight before I went for the Glen Alkey, yeah. and then decided to do both. Um, one thing I think this is interesting is using a little bit of painted uh, malt in the in the mesh. Uh, we, we don't know exactly how much, but it's in there. Um, but also, it's finished in sherry casks. Right now, you'd think tasting this, this is quite a big, thick whiskey. But I have it on very good um, uh, authority from people who work there that this does not like long sherry cast maturations, particularly from the start. Okay. You throw it in the sherry straight away and it tends to die off and veer mm. in places you don't want to go. So they're maturing in ex-bourbon casks and then putting into into sherry. Um, the new made spirit is pretty pretty anonymous, to be honest. It's, it's shy, it's a bit grassy, um, but you don't really get as much from it as with with other things and certainly i think it's great how in australia in these new world markets we put such an emphasis on new make spirit um and it's not to say that that spirit isn't designed out to do well in five years mm. or ten years rather than do well straight off the, the stills which i think is also important um but it's it's quite a, a shy unassuming uh new make spirit so it's it's something that i think you need to work with in experience mm. you need to be there working in jura to, to go along to know how to handle it yeah yeah, yeah. it's only yeah. through experience that you will know mm. how it, it reveals itself but yeah like with the air chocolate i think mocha notes mm -hmm. a bit a bit mm -hmm. like coffee thing it's, it's not a bitter chocolate though it's like a, it's, it's a sweeter milk chocolate it is I say, it actually finishes quite sweet as well like it's got that real like burnt caramel thing like through the middle of it yeah, burn, burn caramel for sure. Particularly like lots of lots of burn caramel, lots of like ripe dark fruits. It's got that like dark cherry thing going on. Mm. It's quite a brooding style of whiskey. It, it is very really cool. Yeah. The word I was using that sort of muddiness and that weight. Yeah. Probably brooding is a better well, word. Well, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not muddy in the way that you'd call like luche muddy. Yeah. It's, it's got quite. I think, Feel like it's still quite just generous mm. and this, this is generous 40, without being flabby this is 40 percent mm. and i would normally on paper steer away from from something at 40 percent mm. not because all whiskies are bad at 40 percent but because i would prefer it to be at 43 or 46 to give myself the chance to water it down mm. to 40. does a whiskey being released at 40 percent tell you something oh. about perhaps the marketing strategy or what they were trying to go for with the release um but potentially i mean 40 percent is the minimum mm -hmm. in bottle scotch yeah, whiskey yeah, yeah. so and when you pour whiskey out of the barrel it's you know you, you're probably feeling in scotland at 63.5 percent mm -hmm. after it runs off the still then over the years you'll lose um through evaporation alcohol content and volume but in different parts of scotland you'll lose one percent or three percent or four percent mm -hmm. depending on where you are so i don't actually know what their average evaporation is but say that this is coming out at your mid 50s you know percent alcohol to get it down to 40 percent what you're doing is adding water so basically the water is water it's mm -hmm. not the bit that was touched by barley and sat in a yeah, barrel yeah. and went through a still um so what you do find is that you keep the price down mm -hmm. so it's almost often a price consideration um particularly in Australia, where we pay essentially a, a tax on a tax. We mm -hmm. pay an excise duty on the physical amount of alcohol volume inside a bottle and GST 10% on top of that. Um, certainly we've seen things like Buffalo Trace uh, slip from, you know, to 40%. We're yeah, one of the few right, markets right, that's, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. a lot of whiskeys at 40%, whether in other places at 43, just to keep them under certain thresholds. Right, right. Um, I don't necessarily think that's what, I mean, this is not a $50 whiskey. You know, this, no, this, no, no. this yeah. sits well above it's like 130, 140 from mm -hmm. memory. Um, so I think it's don't um, try and fix something that isn't broken. Mm -hmm. The sales of Jura have been climbing steadily around the world um, quite consistently over the last decade. Um, certain distilleries have gone, you know, exploded quicker, some have gone a little bit slower, um, but they've always been at 40. Mm -hmm. And if that's their market, mm -hmm. even though they ripped up the range and started again, probably it was due for a refresh, you know. Yeah. I think it was 10 years since they'd sort of introduced most of those original ones. If that's what people are drinking, that's what they like. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. So yeah, so these these are real. I mean, the Jura range is relatively new or in this form is relatively mm. new into Australia. So it's going to take a little bit of time to filter through yeah, into yeah. all the bottle stores, all the bars, and that sort of thing. But for me, it's quite a fascinating little thing because there was that quite visceral and and uh, obvious interest of yeah, people walking yeah. up and saying, "Do you have the new Jura Journey?" Yeah. No. Okay. When you try this, no. That's all they. Yeah, that's yeah, all they were yeah. there for. Where they tried overseas and that sort of thing. Is Jura matured and bottled on the island? Predominantly, but I don't believe all, Paul. Um, good question. So uh, Jura's uh, probably right now or early next year is due for quite a big upgrade. Um, Wider Mackay have just spent a lot of money on Dalmore, uh, which included a lot of visitor centres and, and that sort of thing. Um, Jura is next in line. Um, my beloved Feta Khan, I'm still waiting <laughs> for the, the big... Uh, upgrade there but that might take a few more years but um, one thing about Jury is many years ago they needed a new boiler for the distillery so they shipped it to Isla or got it to Isla and then tried to put it on the ferry to, ah, to Jura yeah, that's funny. and it didn't fit <laughs> so they went okay you have to think of a new plan so they actually sent that one back and sent two smaller boilers that could do the same job and had to ship them over one by one so I think there is a little bit um, because a lot will be sent to blenders straight away or, you know, for the white and Mackay blends and, you know, where is the bulk in those blends coming from? It's coming from Jura. So I think there'd be certain elements sent off straight to the mainland for mm -hmm. the white and Mackay offices. But if you're on Jura and you don't need to move anything, yeah. keep, keep it there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that visitor centre's investment uh, involves some new warehousing as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd need to double check to be to be exact, but that that's my understanding of it. Um, yeah, I mean, this is why... I love whiskey so much. Like on paper, and to the general consumer mm. who uh, who would walk into a bottle store or bar and look at these two whiskeys, they could not be too. They could like you hard to press to get two different mm. whiskeys. Mm. In terms of the look, the color, the messaging, the way bartenders and, and retailers would talk about them, but actually built pretty much. You know, it's Glen Alki, You could argue was a pretty co you know carbon copy of Jura mm. in terms of its build just in a far more accessible place yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the world. Um, <laughs> but they're very different. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you have these two, you start in different centuries, you know, 150 years mm. apart, and this little convergence for about two decades where they were very, very similar, and then all of a sudden they've peeled off again. But what we're trying right now is the legacy and mm. the heritage mm. of that 20 years of convergence when I wasn't alive, you weren't alive. Um, and they've now gone their separate ways. And if we come back here and do the same thing in 10 years or 20 years, we'll have two completely different whiskies, mm. I'm pretty sure. Which, you know, that just that sense of time and space that you get with whiskey and with a lot of aged spirits, just it's what gets me up in the morning. <laughs> so I woke up this morning and said, I can't wait to talk about gonna... Charles McKinley yeah. in 1963. <laughs> How many bottles of Jura is Richard Patterson's nose worth? Uh, very good question. So uh, from Paul Slater again, uh, I would say quite quite a lot. Um, Richard Patterson is known as the nose. He's yeah. the master blender of uh, White and Mackay uh, and a, a great man for flair. Um, he actually, there's a great book that's sort of a biography of his life. Um, and it's something I wanted to introduce, a game they played when he was working very early doors in Glasgow for a... Um, a wine and spirits merchant, but I think predominantly wine. Um, but I think the RSA would, would not get around it these days. But basically, they're all interested in cowboys. Mm. Again, you know, we like the market is the is the American, and so you'd have these they had these doors that almost re, uh, like resemble the sliding doors in an old Western mm -hmm. cafe. And so yeah, yeah. every at like midday every day or whenever it was, it was someone's turn, and they'd line up uh, three shot glasses, and three of them had or two of them had water, and one had like pure New Make spirit. And that was that you had to like put on your cowboy voice, push through the doors, and just grab <laughs> one and shot it, and just hope that you got the water instead of the seventy percent new make spirit. It's like American Russian roulette, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he like he is one of the greatest noses and yeah. blenders in all, in all the world. Um, so yeah, I don't think we could get away with that at the Oak Barrel, <laughs> particularly not for new staff members. Um, that's probably quite frowned upon. Yeah. Um, Hmm. Final thoughts on either of these two whiskies, Joe? I mean, like, I, I was actually just sort of doing that over my head there, and I was kind of like, I think for intrigue and 
you know, interest and excitement and like something that would probably get everybody talking, you take the Jura 12. Yep. Just like for pure palate stimulation and kind of like so many different things to pick at and look at and do whatever. But I think the Glenelicky 18 kind of sits a little bit more with me as a let's just sit, let's reflect, let's break this one down on our own kind of thing. If yeah. that makes sense, like you know, you see in wine, you take one to a party and then you drink one while you're reading a book or something like that. It's kind of that style for me because yeah. this is just you know vibrant and and it's got all these sorts of things going on. I really love that that kind of that smokiness undertone that just it just kind of seems like it has its place. It really sits there without you know being either underwhelming or overwhelming. It's quite well integrated, um, and you know that again that that burnt caramel that kind of like banana toffee thing going on but then the Glen Ellicky, like I think I've got a lot of time for which is just yeah it's yeah I mean we are spicy and enticing and yeah we are talking about a whiskey that's essentially double the price mm. of um mm. of the uh actually not not quite but is is considerably more expensive yeah yeah um you know and I think we have to remember like what I was saying before about these whiskies represent a time and place for me mm. personally even if you don't want to get into whiskey that much and learn all that sort of thing and think it's all a bit of nerdy wank which i can totally understand that's fine as well <laughs> we're drinking a whiskey that is 18 years old and one that is even one that is 12 years old mm. i didn't know you 12 years ago i didn't know you 18 years ago <laughs> neither of us are working at the oak barrel um the world was a completely different place 12 and 18 mm. years ago and so as well as stepping back and admiring these for senses of places and what they mean and what the world was like back in the 60s also back 18 years ago when in fact no more 19 20 years ago when someone farmed barley wherever that was whatever strain that was and they harvested that and then it was malted yeah. and processed and it went to glenallachie and they ran it through a still don't know his or her name who did that yeah, don't, know, yeah. don't know any of that but they did it mm. they touched it it went through the still it went into a barrel and it probably was said, oh, Shivers Regal, you know, that's mm -hmm. going to go into uh, Clan Campbell, which was the big Glenelki, um that was, you know, Glenelki, you know, was the core of that uh, blend for, uh, for Shivers. So it was almost certainly destined for that. And it sat around, it sat around, and for whatever reason, all these casks just happened to last the length and went to 18 years and waited for Billy Walker, who also probably doesn't have the name of the farmer or the, yeah, you know, yeah. the team that distill it said, okay, we're going to get in there with his team, put it together, bottled it, chucked it on a boat. It came all the way around Australia just for us two idiots to open it um, and drink it and talk, talk rubbish about it. That is still, for me, mm. such a special... Every time you open a bottle of whiskey, whether it's 10 years, 50 years, or even three or four years, it's such a special thing. Mm. Uh, um, but, yeah, I, I do agree um, this is a real contemplative dram yeah yeah this is more immediate yeah um, yeah but yeah your party piece I think so yeah I think there have but. been some excellent Jura single casts actually on the um, in fact from both distilleries excellent um, move by Billy Walker when he bought the distillery found some excellent casts and just sold it to independent yeah, bottlers yeah. and so all of a sudden people are talking about these really bizarre Glenallachie mm. casks oh by the way six months later you remember that name? Here's my new range of whiskies. Yeah. But Jura, a little bit tighter, because I think a lot of their stuff goes, you know, stays in house with White and Mackay. There have been some cracking single casts. So if you have had a bit of, you know, time with Jura and sort of on the fence, as I know a lot of people are, you're not one of the, the diehards, I reckon give it, give it another go and, and sit with it. Give it the time because it's it's quite unique and they are upping the flavour a little bit. Yeah. Now these look really smart. But yeah, I think you just see those polarising differences between the two. Um, yeah, yeah. Good whiskey. yeah, yeah. I'm just going to keep you know repeating myself on <laughs> various 1950s uh, and 60s Scotch whiskey history mm. here. Um, so while mm. I keep nosing these, do you want to uh, break open some squash fermented grape juice? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, breaking a few rules here tonight, so it's always a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> don't know if we've ever set rules, but yeah. I don't think anyone who's watching this. Or I've seen any other ones that's gone, oh, they've got some pretty strict rules on what they do yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, what's, what's Joe doing with that bottle of... Oh, he's not going to do... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, God. <laughs> to be fair, that is the authentic oak barrel experience. You want to give you the uh, warts and all. Um, yeah. 
Yes, I mean, obviously, tail ending the whiskey's here, and I've had a busy couple of days, I can say, like, obviously, with visiting producers and, you know, trying to keep up here and, and stuff like that, and um, the decision for this wine tonight was um, interest, but also the kind of, the, the concept behind the wine, and when I say I'm breaking a few rules, it's, uh, this is 100% Grollo, uh, which is a variety, um, native to and also probably home they find in the, in the Loire Valley there. So we are in Anjou, which is a little village a little bit further inland than somewhere like Muscadet, which is quite coastal. You're traveling a little bit further into, you're still along the Loire River. So the soil there is quite um, moist from the, from the river and you're getting a lot of schist, you're getting a lot of sort of decomposed rock and that sort of thing where um, you call Cabernet Franc home and, and Chenin Blanc home, which is uh, where this region quite thrives. And Grollo has been one of those varieties which kind of got that, not bastardization, but it was always early ripening, high yielding, you know, take it off, sell it cheap, put it into rosé. Uh, it wasn't thought all, of, all of my favorite grapes. It wasn't, wasn't thought of too seriously for, for quite a long time and still probably isn't. Uh, you know, you got guys like Robert Parker who was saying that you should pull up all of the Grollo you got planted and put in Cabernet Front. Because Grollo is, is, isn't worth it. It's not a not a variety that, that deserves any sort of respect or, or hard farming or anything like can that. Can we invite Parker on here? <laughs> Get him sitting in the middle. We can grill him on Grollo. I'll just, I'll just call him. Yeah. Um, no, so it's 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 been a, it's been like quite an interesting variety that I've, I've only come to terms with very recently. But nowadays with regions like Anjou and, and the Loire Valley in, in particular, um, some more Champigny and areas like that, you're seeing uh, a lot of, I mean, Burgundy and Bordeaux and, and Champagne and those sorts of regions are quite heavily dominated by laws and restrictions about what you can and can't do. Places like Auvergne, Ardèche, Loire, um, Languedoc, Roussillon are a little bit more, people are able to do a little bit more there. And you'll notice that this wine here, um, just falls under Von de France. Yeah, okay. Because in Anjou, you can't get Anjou AOC um, status with Grollo. For, for those playing at home, Von yeah. de France means wine of France. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like if, if you're um, a lot of European wines, France especially, you could say um, like Bourgogne Rouge, which would be red burgundy wine, or you could say um, Bordeaux Rouge or anything like that. But to get that, to be able to have the ability to put that on your label, you need to um, meet a certain standard of requirement um, that is set by the French wine government to do that. Grollo as a variety doesn't, um, it, it's not allowed to be considered Anjou AOC. Right, so it's it's actually flying under the radar in terms of perceived or like historical quality. Yeah, that, well, okay. if you went to them and said, hey, I want to put Anjou AOC on there, you were growing Grollo, you wouldn't be allowed to do it. It's restricted for Chenin Blanc, Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. So Cabernet Franc as obviously so sort of Chinon, which is which is quite close to where we are now. But that's why I, I kind of sort of had this attraction to it. And he is based um, in a very very small village where a lot of the more I guess low key or low low rating natural winemakers have kind of come from and. Um, you got guys like Lorenzo Yard and, and all of these other uh, growers out there that have, I guess, kind of just understood how varieties react in, in certain ways. So I quite like it because it's it's a wine where it's it's one hundred percent Grollo and it's made to be just like that. Like most like commercial growers and commo uh, commercial winemakers out there send all their Grollo and um, Pinot Denise, which is another wine that he makes to uh, rosé. You just press it off and you make cheap, yep. accessible rosé. This is a wine that was grown and farmed biodynamically um, to be exactly what it is now. And I, I, I quite enjoy that. Um, you're seeing a lot of good Grollo coming out. Francois saint Lo makes a really good one. A few other guys in this area that is doing this. But yeah, as a variety, um, very early cropping, very high cropping, thin skinned, uh, quite easy, easy to grow in the right circumstances and just makes very drink now enjoyable fun fresh it's so on this on this vineyard that Damien Bro farms um it's intertwined it's 40 year old Grollo vines and 
back then when they were planting, a lot of the cuttings got mixed up with gamay. Yeah, so right. it'll be like all grollo and then one gamay vine. Yeah, sort right. of thing and that's that's kind of how it was back when they planted it 40 years ago so treated it very similarly to gamay yeah and you know now everyone's losing their mind over beaujolais and gamay in australia and they want this juicy lovely light fresh easy drinking style of wine um and i think the brawler can provide that as well the ones that i've had yeah um well you do know i have gamay tattooed across my chest yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The only way is gamay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I shoot you not, dear listener, but when we sat down here and I was like, Joe, I'd, I'd like to go first again, you know, because I've got a bit to say. He was like, yeah, well, I actually don't have that much to say about this one. So, yeah, which is obviously bullshit. Um, but um, It's going to get worse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one thing I um, I did want to ask you, you mentioned so early harvest, mm-hmm. but high harvest. Yeah. What, what, is, what does high harvest mean? What high cropping? High cropping. So you so, basically get more volume on the vine it's it's a yield concern it's a yield concern yeah and like you know if you are a large corporation and you want to just you want to get as many bottles of wine made as you possibly can that's a dream so like merlot or you know certain other varieties that are treated in ways around the world it does carry that stigma of being like you just probably just goes into shitty rosé right um Yield being the favourite word of accountants. Yeah, who's yeah exactly. Uh, but no, so like what I find quite interesting about Damien Barreau especially is that he is in this little tiny pocket of Anjou in the Loire where these really, really passionate um, winemakers all chat and talk. He, he, he's in the same shed as, as Kenji Hodgson. I don't know if you ever remember the Galano Cabernet Franc? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it's on our website as well. I think we're sold out at the moment, but uh, same same shed, things made in the same way, yeah. and it's been quite an inspiration for a lot of young growers and winemakers in this region for going first of all organically and, and getting out of the, the um, harmful sprays. And he is also um, not adding any sulfur at all, which is kind of just the norm with his little sort of um, crew there. And uh, when I said I was sort of breaking a few rules, this is a five year old wine. It's kind of like, it's made with this bastardized varietal, which no one's really given too much attention to, except for these really small pocket of, of very passionate wine growers, um, made basically untouched, all wild ferment, no filtration, no, no sulfur additions, no chemical additions of any kind, no additions of any kind, and then basically put into a bottle. And then if we were drinking the 18 or the 19, you're like, oh yeah, cool, that's, that's fun, that's exciting. We're drinking the 14. Yeah. So this has been in bottle for five years, untouched with no additions whatsoever. And I mean, yeah. So what I, I might um, give my first impressions of this, mm. and, and you can maybe pick out what mm. I might be finding that I'm, I don't understand. But um, I was expecting, um, you know, something really funky, mm-hmm. really out there, because we obviously know a lot of the Australian natural wines. Which not only are we, you know, sort of hands off sometimes, you know, our producers, but they're also actively seeking weirdness. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know the French have been doing biodynamic and organic for, mm-hmm. for ages. Natural wine is not a new thing to them. So I was thinking something a little bit crazier, a little bit more earthy, but it's quite lifted. Um, the thing that surprised me on the palate was that spritz. Yeah. They just, which, yeah. Um, you know, I didn't expect. Obviously, I, mm. I don't drink, you know, Grollo on a nightly basis. So yeah, I'm yeah. not too sure what so I'm meant to be looking for. But so, um, but like the, the fruit and the lushness for me is still there. Mm. Um, so you know, what what am I finding in that in a fourteen that I would be different in a eighteen or a nineteen? Well, I think I think you can probably come out and say now that it's not as acid forward and blah blah blah. Like it's not as juicy and fruity and jumping out of the glass and bouncy as it probably was in as it was month before. Must have been pretty bloody bouncy. Well, yeah. <laughs> But it's still like it's still still got that lovely retained acidity, and I think that when you, I mean, you see a lot of you know no addition wines and stuff like that, and anything like with with wine that is that is literally living in a bottle hasn't been stunted with anything, anything can kind of happen. And I think that that spritz or that early bottle, like I said, it's it's early ripening, so obviously gets quite high acidity very quickly, and then you pull it off the wine. This is they say it's eleven percent. It's probably closer to ten. In terms right, of an okay. ABV, um, that, that's happening in the bottle. Uh, no, no, that's just happening as they're making it. And oh, okay, they, need, yeah. they need to put a number on it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of leeway between whichever way you want to go. And <laughs> please, please, no taxation well, yeah. officers on this stream. 
Well, and to be fair, like, I mean, the other one, like, um, one of my favorite wines last year, or two of my favorite wines last year were Francois St. Lowe's Hey Grow Grollo. Yep. He's in a very similar um, region to where Damien Bro is. And that was 9.5% naturally. So obviously you're not adding anything and it just it just comes out like that. It's just, it's, it's vibrant, it's young, it's not like, you know, over the top. It's You see it in this wine, it's just lovely fruit. There's that certain purity and that certain acidity, even after five years, it's still singing. Um, so one of the one of the reasons that I did kind of want to go for this was to be like, this is five years old with no chemical additions whatsoever, and probably has another five years to go. Yeah, easily. Yeah. 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 Am I confusing acidity with spritz? Because I don't I, think so. Okay. I mean, like, I, like I see what you mean. It's kind of that, that, yeah, that, that buzz, me, that kind yeah, of, yeah. It jumps off, and you didn't yeah. get the. Maybe I'm just yeah. doing it. The, it's, it spritz first, mm. and then into a acidity. Mm. And I thought they were the same thing, but yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's 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 like actual physical spritz in the wine. No, no, and you can, you can see there's yeah. nothing, but I'm, I felt it. Yeah, I, do, I just think it's that kind of that's that zippiness. It's that it is acidity, but I don't think it's acidity as to what we would generally associate with acidity. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of. It's just this freshness and I mean what I also love about this wine is it's just it's so unassuming. It's you know, Von de France, red French wine, but yeah. it is absolutely beautiful. Um so, I mean what one of the the, the the things I've most enjoyed about um, you know, these sorts of the the tastings that we've televised mm. is because normally we drink when we're doing this just quite standard, stock standard, you know, okay, it's the Three Chardonnays are all going to say yeah, twenty four yeah, ninety five. Yeah. Which one do we pick? Type thing, you know, X Y Z whiskey. But we've actually thought about these ones a little bit. We drank the Pays and we drank, you know, yeah, so like yeah. some, you know, quite Northern Burgundies and, mm. and that sort of stuff. Um, do you see a move towards these sorts of grapes? Like, are we, you know, better than I were? Like, are we moving these sorts of bottles more than we were a year ago, two years ago? No. Okay. But I definitely think <laughs> I, I think I think we actually no no sorry tell that um, there's another variety that. Damien makes and a lot of the guys in the Loire make and you're seeing a little bit more I've come out now is Pinot de Nice mm -hmm. uh, which has made quite a resurgence from I think it was less than two hectares in the world at some point and more and more um, but it's just it's it's um you could be the next game the way I see it it's kind of it's made in that style of it doesn't have that stigma or that this is what this should taste like or, you know, this is what Shiraz should taste like, this is what Cabernet should taste like, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's made to be um, enjoyed and it's just made to be consumed very, like, with with friends. And um, a neighbour of Damien's, Lorenz Soyad, who I mentioned earlier, again, one of the, probably one of the most popular wines we had last year was called La Pause. Yep. Yeah, yeah. If you remember that one, which was, I think, pretty closely, 50% Pinot Denise, 50% Gamay. And the wine was actually never really supposed to be um, released. It was what he was making and what he was bottling, and that was what they drank at lunch. Hence yeah, the yeah. That was the that was the break wine, and it's just so enjoyable and so easily consumed. And I think we get so hung up on what a wine's supposed to be at certain times rather than what it's actually meant to be. Yeah, that's why I quite like this wine because it's just, you don't have you don't get a lot of mental assumption before you're drinking it. It's just you know Grollo is such a fun really you know, vibrant easy drinking variety but it does have that stability that will let it go for five six seven eight nine ten years um so we'll see that in gamay um, more and more so we'll see it in Grollo. we'll see it in Cab uh, cabernet franc we'll see it in pinot de nice we'll see it in all these light-skinned juicy red varieties because like it's getting hot yeah <laughs> like i don't want to drink 15.5 percent cabernet every day i want to drink 11 percent Grollo <laughs> with my friends <laughs> Um, jumping out very quickly, we've um, we've been talking to each other a little bit. We've ignored a few people and who've been on there. So, good day to Matt and Brock and and, and the Joe Perry fan clubs rocked up as oh, well. Oh, sicker, yeah, yeah. It's uh, that's always good. Um, she hasn't made a World Cup remark yet, but um, I'm sure that's coming. Well yeah, done, South I, Africa. I, I, I saw that last name and I thought, yeah. well, what was that? <laughs> are we allowed to have these people on this stream yet? Um, <laughs> uh, and and Simon McGoram, uh, who we're very excited to have here at the Oak Bowl tomorrow night pouring some pretty excellent uh, boutique whiskies uh, from the boutique whiskey company. Um, if you haven't got a ticket, uh, please don't ask me for one because I'm already jam-packed. Uh, yeah. 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 Sometimes you forget 500 mil bottles. 
and um, yeah, we're going to make some things stretch tomorrow. We're going to be uh, uh, yeah. So how do you go heard, box? Go yeah, box. well, how yeah. Do, no, to be fair, where's where's the band button again on that one? <laughs> that's right. the The Wallabies got a new coach today, so that's uh, that's all right. We're going to. Oh, Boys, well, well, South Africa win it what every twelve years? South Africa have to win a World Cup. Yeah, but so, surely we're due. That's going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> give give me one day of optimism. Cricket starts tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, but uh, yes. Yeah, so g'day and everyone. For, thank you for joining in. The numbers have been very good all night tonight. Um, and uh, before I jump back into this wine, uh, we actually had no idea what we we're going to pour tonight until about mm. half an hour beforehand. Um, but if you guys had, if you like this format of you know comparing two whiskies or you know maybe picking something obscure, if there's something you'd like to theme us on, um, please let us know. Um, it's an incredibly busy time of the year for everyone involved in this industry, which is why we haven't had uh, producers and people on mm. the show quite yet. We're gonna we'll kick that off in January when everyone calms down a little bit. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, if you have got any things you'd, you'd like to see from us, please let us know. Um, come in the store and, and that sort of thing. Um, but jumping back onto what, what you were saying about mm. these these lighter grapes and, and that sort mm. of thing, um, you know, we I wanted to sort of row back a little bit in that. You know, you were talking about the style, that the mm. lighter, summery style, and you know, you see it in French, you know, spirits and things as well, like pomos and mm. and pinots and stuff that are built for the Australian um, climate and summer. We just haven't figured it out yet. Um, we we this natural wine thing, it's a buzzword in um, Australia and around the world at the moment. But natural is the word is really the one that you're stuck. You know, it was called yeah. naked. Yeah, it was yeah, called yeah. hands off. It yeah. was called you know minimal intervention. All these sorts of things beforehand. And what we consider as natural now, the French have been doing for a long, long time. Mm. So I mean, how do you see? You know, if if someone walks into the oak barrel and says, "I'm just looking to get into natural wine. Mm. I tried one at a bar. The bartender said this is a new natural wine. Mm. Don't really know what it means." What makes you pull to Australia? What makes you pull to somewhere like France or even Italy that have been doing it for a while as well? Yeah, I think it's it's quite an interesting point. Um, you know, we do get that question a lot. Um, <laughs> Concentrate on the wine and leave the rugby to the professionals. Yeah, fair play, <laughs> yeah. fair play, <laughs> fair play. Um, <laughs> Good comment. I think. Um, yeah, I think that 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 natural wine buzzword is is you know being so good but also so bad for the industry as a whole but i think it's that association of when you like even when you're mentioning the pomos and you know certain eau de vies that are quite light and spirit and whatever i don't feel as though you know your distillers or or your farmers or your damien burrows of the world are sitting there late at night in their tiny little shed getting their little two-ton crop harvest off going like yeah, I really just want this to be big in the Sydney market. I think it's like, it's how you grow up, it's it's what you're eating, it's what the seasons give to you, it's it's that reflected. I think it's reflected more in Europe than it is in Australia, where, you know, this, this sort of wine or um, those sorts of spirits, that's what is being consumed, you know, during the, the seasons. Yeah. That yeah. sort of way, like you're not going looking for big, heavy things, you're not drinking or eating big, heavy meals all the time. Um, but I think in Australia, there's a little bit more of a manipulation to being like, we'll make it like this because that's what people want, rather than make it like this because that's what your vineyard is giving you, if yeah. that makes sense. Um, but yeah, no, I think that there's there's some, like a lot of people in Australia making some, some very, very good wine. But I think that, and it's, it's, it's a whole conversation that we could have of just like natural's been so good for getting exposure to smaller wineries and that sort of thing mm. but at the same time it's kind of painted ourselves in a corner a little bit of being like well that wasn't as weird as the last one you made so, yeah yeah um yeah so guess, this isn't a weird one no yeah. and I, I was act actively thinking that i was like well let's do whiskey first so i can mm. um you get, get like have something good before yeah. I get onto whatever Joey's going to come up, and the um, the uh, Scots fan club has turned up, but we're just going to ban them. Is it um, still your birthday? Yeah, it's been my birthday, <laughs> my birthday for many many years. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a thing that's going to come with time. You know, because a lot of this, 
uh, and I've heard you describe it as a really great way at one of your natural wine tastings was the old Macca's analogy of turning your farm into organic and going that way mm. where you, you know, eat Macca's all your life and then from six yeah, you go yeah, yeah, vegetarian. Yeah. Um, I, that's going to take time. Maybe you want to recite that one. I don't know if you stole it from someone or something. But. No, I think it's, it's um, what's, yeah, because it's always a long conversation we have is like, is this natural? And it's like, well, you could be doing, like, like what we say to customers all the time is that a lot of the producers that we stock and we carry, you know, would not never even think of, of spraying harmful chemicals in their vineyards, but are just so small that they don't get the eco cert or the, the sticker that goes onto their wine to prove that they are organic. Because, um, because that is expensive and time consuming. It's expensive, consuming. It's time consuming. A little sticker that says organic. And like at the end of the day, if you're, you know, you, you know you're a, a grower or you're a winemaker that has vineyards and the season is just exceptionally difficult and you've got, you know, a wife, you've got kids that need to be fed and you are faced with the reality of going, well, I can spray and save hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of grapes or I need to stick to my guns and, and lose it all. You know, what, what, do, you, what do you do? Yeah. Um, so I know a lot of people like that that just don't want to have the pressure of being fully organic just in case something like that happens, which is very prone to in certain areas of the world. Case case study the last month in yeah. all of Australia. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, so I think the, the, the Macca's analogy is, um, is that of, especially you see it in places like Austria, California, here in Australia, these vineyards that have been farmed conventionally with pesticide and herbicide for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, organic growers come in or organic winemakers come in and they want to convert the vineyard. So all they do is they just stop the sprays and then, you know, stop the, the um, chemical treatment to, to these vines. And then they just, it just wilters and it suffers because for the last 40 years, these vines have been getting um, artificial, you know, uh, and nutrients, nutrients yeah. yeah, to them. And then you just, you take it away and then vineyards die basically because it hasn't had the, the structure so I think that's I'm always very very impressed when you see vineyards that, that have never been sprayed and then you know good viticulturists can convert vineyards to organics but it just takes time yeah yeah and for me I think the most important thing is in the vines themselves but also the, the you know the point of the the grower is it's like okay you're not there yet but is that what you're going for yeah I mean the big one for me last year was blind corner who would now have um biodynamically inverted vineyards and it was it was a bit of a journey but you could tell that was what they were trying to achieve yeah it's like if like if that makes sense like you know that's that's really important and then you know in places like europe and loire and burgundy and stuff they i wouldn't say it's a, a luxury but there are vineyards out there that have been farmed like that well 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 before we knew what we were doing over here yeah yeah and i think um the reason why we, we mentioned the word Maccas was the example you you gave yeah, of... Yeah. yeah, so if you are, you're you brought up on fast food or, or anything like that um, and have been eating Maccas all your life and that's kind of what your body's used to and like your body is basically the equivalent of the vineyard in this sense and then yep. one day you just turn around and decide cold turkey, I'm going to be salads and, and fruit or whatever. It's like you're going to go through a pretty rough <laughs> yeah. patch. Um, With, withdrawal is the word, I think. Withdrawal, yeah. Yeah, and just being like, your body's going to freak out and go, well, you know, hold on, I've been getting this for so long. Yeah. Why am I not getting it now? Yeah. So that um, uh, Macca's sponsorship for this live stream yeah. <laughs> probably just gone out the window there. Um, it's only, uh, I'd say, they're, they're Joey's yeah. opinions himself. I, yeah, But uh, if Macca's want to give us a million bucks an episode to do this, we'll happily take that still. Yeah, I, don't know, I had Macca's the other day. And just, it's one of those things. It's like kind of vice versa when you haven't had Macca's for so long. Then you eat it, and it's like, oh, geez, right. but yeah. And um, we'll actually give a very special mention to Charlie Simpson as well from Virtuous Vine, who was responsible for not only importing this wine but a lot of other wines that we stock in the shop. And one of the most passionate people that I know in the wine industry for organic farming, um, minimal invention winemaking. But I just like his, like all of his, all the wines that he selects and chooses are. They're just clean, you know? It's never trying to be like crazy funky or anything like that. But uh, yeah, his, his wines are excellent. His portfolio yeah. is excellent. So. I was, I was yeah, going to put a virtuous vine. Yeah. Um, he was actually in store today. Yeah, he, he was. Yeah, he, he missed, missed him, him, you, missed you him at, at lunch. You yeah. were out eating Maccas at lunch and um, yeah. he came in. Um, 
but uh, yeah, like I've got so much time for for what Charlie mm. has done, and you know this this is a fourteen. You can't go out and buy this fourteen anymore. This no. is certain stuff we've held on yeah. to and chucked in the vault and kept back just you know often to see what what will happen. Mm. Um, I, I know I did that by accident with a few Australian natural wines. Yeah. You know the old uh, Lucy M. What was the is Monomith the red circle one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the Pinot, I think yeah. it was. Or was it Red Blend? You know, it was a Pinot. It, it was, was a Pinot, Pinot and yeah. sort of just uh, chucked it away mm. in the back of the cupboard and forgot about it and yeah. pulled it out four or five years later and went, oh, bugger, I probably should have drank yeah. that. And, but those accidents are excellent sometimes. But that's like, there's a conversation that you see popping up all the time and it's like, we're never going to be hardcore natural wine only or anything like that but I you know that's the wines that I drink a lot of is um, you know minimal or, or no sulfur if possible um, but they're wines that the first thing you hear is like you should probably drink it young yeah. obviously drink it younger like but you know red especially the reds like you, you know red grapes have have tannins in them have structure which which will help it age and that's why I was quite you know I was being a little bit cheeky but I was you know pretty keen to, to yeah. get this one open just because it's like this is aged better than a lot of commercially produced reds that I've had in the last 12 months. So, in that vein of cheeky, do we have any more of this? Mm. I think we've got two or three bottles yeah. laying around the store. And like, roughly what is it going for? Uh, sitting about 50 bucks a bottle. Which, I mean, yeah. I think it's not a, it's not a cheap bottle of wine by any stretch. Um, but I think the the entitlement. I just like. I mean, Damien probably sells it to some local bottle stores. You know, Charlie gets a little bit. Some of the importers get a little bit. But I think it's it's wine that just has a very special place, especially when you look at how Grollo is kind of visualised on a on a large scale level of just being this cheap whatever. Um, and he's done some very special things with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, what the fourteen's the last we've seen. I don't know if we've seen fifteens yet. So. Yeah, yeah, I have to ask Charlie. Yeah. Um, but there is one thing I want to say, um, and I know we're going to run a little bit over time tonight, but um, at the risk of your girlfriend killing me, I've got a couple of more questions. <laughs> um, we are beholden, like, we get the glory, and I say this quite a bit when it comes to what I do in the spirits. There's producers who make this, farmers who farm this, mm. and then we get to be the guy who stand here and pour it for you at tastings or sell it to you and be really excited about it. We get all the glory, but Charlie... And I know there's like there's a bunch of other um, importers in wine and spirits and, and even beer as well that fly all around the world and do all their work, you know, is going and meeting these people, making personal connections and relationships. Mm. Because as you say, the local restaurants, the local market, let alone all the rest of Europe yeah. would take this. They don't need to send yeah, XYZ yeah. bottles to, to us. But I think it's also like there's um there's that special kind of talent or you know knack for being in this sh like it's not a wine it's a shed like there's no chateaus or anything like that it's it's, it's chateau a, shed yeah chateau shed it's a, it's a garage it's that kind of thing where um this stuff's being made like and there's a certain knack for being able to travel halfway across the world rent a car drive to wherever you need to go to sit in the shed and drink beer and whatever and um, taste out of barrels and go yeah it's pretty good yeah and then go you know I'm, I'm gonna I want to bring this into Australia like that I, the, God knows I couldn't do it you know it's it's, it's oh you, you could it's yeah oh, but it's could. just having that special knack for picking incredible incredible wines like 100% of the time and then filling a portfolio full of it and yeah you know, yeah this is what I'm gonna bring to Australia it's like it's just he's never missed a beat no and you know and g'day to Matt Bailey who I, I know is who uh, is the ambassador for the Scotchman Whiskey Society, and I watched his stream a little earlier tonight, who's gonna to share my sentiments, which is what your sentiments are as well, is, you know, and we're gonna pick on Charlie a little bit here because yeah. it's his bottle of wine, and there's definitely a lot of people in the industry that do this. Our passion stems from their passion, yeah. which stems yeah. from the producer's passion mm. as well. You know, if I remember like, I've been into certain distilleries, um, not necessarily in Australia, uh, maybe, maybe one or two in Australia, but, when you're over in Scotland and, and you're like, I'm, I'm in bloody Scotland. Yeah, I'm going to go yeah. to this distillery. You get I'm gonna, overwhelmed. I'm going to drink yeah, all this yeah. thing. And you've got like this tour host or someone who's like, yeah, they make it here. They do that there. The gift shop's over there. Yeah. So I think it's like, ah, oh, do you know how far I've flown yeah, to, to yeah. be here? And all that sort of stuff. 
Um, and you know, you, you see that in you know in all facets of life. But if you get someone who yeah. comes into the oak barrel, or is you know at some sort of you know tasting event, and they go, "This is it. I was there, and this happened," or yeah. like I've, I finally got a parcel of lift, mm. and then you go over there, and it's like I'm so. You sell it in Sydney, in Australia, and they're so excited that their mm. wine's getting over there, and they're so excited to show you around. You know that just fuels us. Oh, I totally. Mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think um, the other, the other very quick point we make is that Charlie also imports the wines of Nicholas Jolie, mm. probably one of the the well, the godfather of, of biodynamic farming and wine production in um, France and, and the world. And I remember having this conversation with him and being like, "Well, how did you get onto these wines? Like Nicholas Jolie is pretty famous. He doesn't make a lot of wine." Um, does some amazing things with Shannon Blanc and he was just saying like oh you know I, I met him at a, a wine fair or something like that and he invited me over and I drove in through the gate and it just felt special yeah like the the, the, the vineyard and the estate just, just felt way different to how the rest of the region felt yeah well, that's that's kind of what it does and if anyone um, they're not cheap but if anyone does get the opportunity to try the wines of Nicholas Jolly they are lifetime wines really really yeah. special yeah yeah um, yeah, and I, I don't think Charlie will be tuning in tonight because I believe he's working. Um, he's got a, a few rock star shifts to do it tonight. Up at DSE? Yeah, no, yeah. I don't know, yeah, so, somewhere tonight. Mm. But um, Charlie, we, we love you and yeah. please come back soon. We'll get you on. Yeah, <laughs> actually, that would be a, a right. <laughs> Good fun. I mean, it might be actually dangerous. I might have to step yeah. out. Of it. I don't think the three of us can be on a, on a stream <laughs> together um, for that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I guess that sort of sums up what we try try to do here and it's getting busier and busier towards the end of the year you know for, for everyone in the industry um and as i touched on before and uh, new people joining in we'll get some producers and um some people that we really respect in the industry as well mm -hmm. importers and brand investors and that sort of stuff to come and sit in between us um in the new year mm -hmm. uh, when, when that happens but um i just i think yeah I learn something new about wine every time I sit down with you, which is, which, which is fantastic and what it's all about. And, you know, these, you know, these grapes and these sort of production that we're talking about tonight, there's always something new to learn. Mm. And I think you'd agree you're still learning about wine. I'm still learning about spirits and whiskey. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So I think the, 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 the moment you stop learning is kind of the, the be all end all really, hey? like That's pretty sad day. Yeah. It's like, I don't, I don't know anything about wine. I'm, go, I'm getting into soil. That's, that's my next venture. I was really disappointed that um, on your little tag I put up before, I said, but where's the grapes? Because I knew you were going to come second. Should have put soil nerd. Should have put, put soil nerd. I'll take that as my official title. Well, next time, just don't wear a shirt. Well, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, like, I'm, like a soil, I'm a soil beginner. If I was to ever earn the like the proper soil nerd title, I'd be I'd be pretty pretty. Happy no, about. no, I think I think a nerd can be a nerd can be at any level. Mm. I mean, I was a whiskey nerd before I knew anything about whiskey. Wouldn't you be more of a geek? I think you'd be a geek before you'd be a nerd. Be a whiskey geek and not actually know a whole lot. No, but see, a whiskey. I, th I think the word geek implies a little bit of uh, you know self-absorption and assumption. Well, yeah. Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like nerd demands like some sort of like baseline knowledge expectation. Okay. Could be a whiskey dog. We oh definitely that. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been there from the start, but that's sort of the way that like people will be talking about something cool and exciting, and I'll talk about. Yeah, it's just like this whiskey I tried. Yeah. Oh, Christ, Scott, shut up. Will you? <laughs> that that's dork. Okay. Between now and whenever this stream is next week, I will find the definition between geek and nerd. If I can walk around and confidently call myself a soil nerd, I will. Yeah. But I just don't know if I've earned that privilege yet. I, I I'd call you a soil nerd. Yeah. I think um I think you're definitely on the way there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there was um. One whiskey I thought about doing tonight, which you might do next week, which is the um, Hobart de Seren. While we're sort of talking, I'll just throw it. Oh, which one from Hobart? It's, uh, Hobart. 
uh, Barry, Big Bad Bustling Bassett said, was a Zelda nerd before I discovered alcohol. Oh, mate, I was a Zelda nerd as well. <laughs> I think, okay, in this case, I think nerd has to rely to, or like apply to some sort of quality. Yeah. I got absolutely slaughtered every time I played that game, so I would definitely be at... How do you get slaughtered in Zelda? It's like an adventure game. I know. Ask <laughs> Greg, Greg Chance, whose house I went over in primary school to go play it. I don't know how I lost, but I, I'd lose all the time. It's probably his fault. Who yeah, knows? We were talking Nintendo 64, aren't we, on this one? Or? I mean, I wasn't alive when Nintendo 64 was around. <laughs> like it's my 21st birthday today. <laughs> um, we have veered dangerously off track. Um, so I think we should probably grab the train, yeah. pull, pull it back onto the it back on. correct terminal and uh, relatively wrap up for tonight. Um, thank you everyone who has watched and commented tonight. Uh, as with, with all uh, streams we do with this, the Jira and the Glenallachie are going straight behind, or whatever's left after I leave tonight, they're going straight behind the counter. Um, so please come along and and ask for a dram and have a chat about them. Um, I would really love to have people come and ask for for Jura. I think it's, yeah. such, a, it's such a cult thing that people but it's are so fun in, at the same time. Yeah, they're yeah. so in their lanes by it. They don't want to jump lanes mm. a little bit on it. So um, to get new people coming up, a Ocarina of Time Forever. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm jumping, like, I don't even know what that is, but I'm assuming it's some sort of video game. But, the video game. Mate, if it didn't, like, apart from Zelda, which I was terrible at, if it didn't have cars or sports in it, it wasn't a real video game. <laughs> but please come up and, mm. and the, these are, they're all sitting behind us, come and have a chat mm. and uh, talk rubbish with us, because it's obviously what we uh, do most of the day. Um, yeah, is that, I mean, we've got, what, Patiki tomorrow, which is well, yes. and, well and done. Please don't. Buy more tickets to Boutique. Glen Dronic next week, which is. Yeah, so ne next week's a big week for yeah, uh, yeah. the old spirits department. So we got Glen Dronic, which is well and truly sold out. Mm. No, I can't get you in on Tuesday. Lafroig on Wednesday. No, I can't get you in on Wednesday. There are about 10 tickets left to Lafroig on Thursday. Sweet. Which is Dan Woolley's final go round. Yeah, right. So Dan, Dan Woolley and his uh, wife, uh, uh, Billy Jean, uh, starting their own whiskey brand in 2020 yeah. so the face of Lefroig for a long long time in this country is is stepping away from the distillery he loves most uh, so we're gonna do a bit of bit of a send-off have a bit of fun crack some old bottlings um, the ticket price is, is a little bit pricey it's 99 bucks but you get a little because we're giving away yeah. a bottle of yeah. 10 year old to everyone who comes and the 10 year old is currently sitting at 110 bucks on the shelf so you do the maths I don't know how they convinced me to do this yeah. but I've, uh, I'm losing money for the ticket <laughs> myself and that's all right uh, and then we've got the horrific thing that I've been doing the past week of putting uh, new events up with the number 2020 behind them. Oh, yeah. Which is a, is a brand new concept for me to uh, be thinking about 2020. Well, actually, James is here on Friday. James on Friday. Yeah, so we'll have Go James, James Erskine of uh, Australian Natural Wine Stardom. The, yeah. The, yeah, one, one, of the, the, one of the OGs and... A very good uh, long-time friend of the Oak Barrel and of, and of mine. Um, he's up here for like a super quick weekend trip, so we're going. He's going to um, grab some some really cool stuff out of a cellar, some older stuff. He was he was talking about. We can't sell it, but we can sure as hell drink it. Um, and that's going to be Friday night. Yeah. And yeah, let the cards fall as they may. Yeah, I'm actually like what you can't see where this camera is positioned. If you've been in the store recently, it's actually atop the Lucy M. Uh, well, it's, well, it's left of the mm. not of empty boxes, but what's left of the Lucy M. allocation uh, for the for the end of the year. And James Erskine with his Yama brand is probably the only one that I would put next to Anton Van Klopper yeah. and his Lucy M. brand as the people who really brought this into yeah. the the psyche of Australian yeah. wine drinkers. So it's going to be going to be pretty special. That it's it's going to be going to be a fun little tasting. Have you done a tasting with him before? I have. Yeah, because I've done about three yeah. with him here. And How many all, do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 they're pretty special events. They're and it's always fun. like, we're going to pour more stuff that we can never try again. Or yeah, yeah. Let alone sell. But we... like, James for me is, is kind of like one of the kings of, of Grenache down that way. And when you get something that's got, you know, a bit, bit of age on it and 
he's really put some thought into. It's, it's yeah, again, it's, it's lifetime wine. Yeah. So it, we, we're going to have a, a lot of fun, mm. basically, is the answer to this. Um, then you have a few things to announce for, for next year. Um, did I tell you I just locked in my three days in Dubbo? No. Gin, whiskey, and tequila at the mighty establishment bar in Dubbo. Yeah, right. In uh, sort of late, late January. Is that three nights in a row? Yeah. Oh, boy. I oh, know. It's going to be excellent. I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait. It's going to be... So do a lot of tastings off-site. Mm. Um, and one of the... I love the the greater west of... Uh, mm. in the central west of New South Wales. And um, very lucky to be invited back. They invited me back once. I thought that was going to be enough. Yeah. But they invited me back a third time to do some stuff at a bar. So that's going to be lots of fun. Um, and yes, when uh, Hannah does tune in to the stream, it probably means we... Uh, yeah, I trouble. think so. Man, I've really enjoyed this uh, mineral water we've been drinking tonight. Yeah, and it's yeah. been great introducing everyone to these non-alcoholic spirits tonight. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, yep. Thank, thank you very much, everyone, for um, coming along with us. Well, Scott, I have to go and get home at an appropriate time. Yes, okay. well, yeah. as you say every night, <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> um, but look, I think the numbers have been stronger again this mm. week than, than ever before, so thank you, everyone, for, for joining in. Let, uh, let, also let us know, though, like... I mean, because we're kind of scattergunned on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. I mean, everyone everyone watches, you know, different days and that sort of thing. Pieces. But you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Tuesday night podcast. To be fair, yep. When I'm in the city, yep. We we, we, we can figure that out. But like you know, mm. we we're very open to letting you guys decide yeah. how this this moves forward. Um, show us your pens. Thank you, Matt Bailey. I was waiting all night for that one. And yes, I have been writing with um, a Schaefer, which is a German design pen. This it's it's a rollerball. It's not a fountain pen tonight, um, but it's uh, made in China. <laughs> Joey's very interested in this. <laughs> but I'm actually running. It's made in China. I'm running German ink through it. So uh, that is the pen I've been writing with tonight. As I've been jotting down questions to ask Joey. Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit too scared scared to ask questions on on pens, <laughs> but I do want to know what German ink. Differs from regular ink. It's about flow, mate. It's all about flow. <laughs> Rappers, they don't know nothing. It's all about flow. Pen flow. Mm. Um, and just to wrap up, uh, Big Bad Bustling Bazir, uh, Bazaar. I'm doing wines at the west of the County Katoomba, Australia. Long weekend, Saturday and Sunday, 15 for wine tasting from Orange and Western Wineries. Excellent. Oh, that sounds awesome. So if you're not out in Dubbo drinking tequila with me, yeah. <laughs> make sure you get to Katoomba and drink wine with Bazaar. I don't get to Katoomba and drink yeah. wine. But um, we have veered... Again, dangerously off topic. Yeah, it goes like that. Um, these are all going to be open all week if you want to come and try stuff. Um, thank you again to the the importers. Again, two very different importers for, for both these brands mm. who have sort of donated bottles over the, over the years for us. We have, um, if you do find yourself in town tomorrow night, we're doing a free tequila tasting at the front bar um, oh, just behind us with Rooster Rojo. As you will all know, a very famous brand that sponsors a lot of motorsport in the German VLN series, uh, which obviously is exceptional to everyone else. But tequila is good as well. Uh, and then uh, a few things coming up as well. But um, thank you very much. And we're going to wrap up and we are. go home and be sensible. Different time next week. Cheers. Cheers. It's always it's the double click that yeah, gets me yeah. every time. You're obviously still there.